Yeah, we start. Yeah. All right, welcome back. So we'll have a really a full agenda today. And uh, so I, I know that uh, a lot of you uh, felt last time it was a little overwhelming in terms of the materials of the course. Uh, just wait until today. Uh, that's <laughs> that's really bad at that part, whether last week was overwhelming. Okay. So the basic topic today is going to be the basics of the data analysis. This is uh, the second uh, lecture in the series that uh, really is not require you to know the experimental design itself. So I don't need to know which sample is corresponding to what, and this is really very generic stuff. Okay, and um, and then it doesn't move. Oh. Let me see. So just, uh, I, I would like to usually that give a little bit review, review for what we talked about last time. So we talk about the first part is the uh, keywords of next generation sequencing. And uh, by the way, my review slides are usually very important because this is some part that I may put that into the exam questions. Okay, so just be careful about that. So the th three keywords, the first one is the sequencing. It sequences both DNA and RNA and most of the protocols sequence direct DNA. And RNA, some of the, the, the platforms start to pick up can directly sequence the RNA molecules. And the second keyword is uh, the short rates, and it's anywhere from 35 to 150 basis for Illumina platform, and a little bit longer for some other platforms. And, uh, but the third keyword is very important, which is uh, ultra high throughput. That will be uh, five billion rates with our current instrument, and uh, that we could have higher, even higher output uh, for some other instruments. And in this one, you can see that we are talk, we talk about a little bit on the mate pairs and pair ends. Remember that? So we, we, we see that from, from the same DNA molecule, we can sequence both both, uh, both two ends. So that's uh, the keywords of the NGS technology. We talk about it intensively on the uh, the leading platforms, and uh, and the specific we get into a couple of uh, different platforms regarding their um, their biochemistry, why they are sequencing that fast. We went through the Illumina protocol solid a little bit. 454, we did. We just have one slide to show it, and the Pacific Bioscience and the Aaron Torrent and Nanopore. So I think we, we we very briefly go through the biochemistry part of it, but I want to pinpoint a few key uh, things I want you to really understand. The first one is uh, uh, from the Illumina solid and 454, and also the Aaron Torrent. These four technologies, we usually refer to that as a, uh, the second generation sequencing. And for the Pacific Biosciences and the Nanopore, these two, some people call it a third generation sequencing. So what are the major differences of these two? Okay, there are several differences. First one is uh, whether we need amplification or not. So if you see that uh, for most of these uh, second generation platforms, uh, Illumina, we specific talk about the bridge amplification. For the solid, that will be the emotion PCR part. So that is the amplification part. If we need amplification, and usually second generation sequencing need uh, the amplification. Well, for Pacific Biosciences and the Nanopore, these two are single molecule sequencer, meaning that you do not need to have a, a, a amplification to go directly for the, for the sequencing. And we talk about uh, the Pacific Bioscience, there is a, a, a polymer that's sitting in the hole that can shine when the, new, the right nucleotide comes in. So you want to really uh, go back to your notes and to uh, fresh your memory what I was talking about. And nanopore is also you do not need amplification to, to go forward. So, so that's the first uh, difference. The second major difference is, is of course, the length of the RAID. And uh, the, the, the second generation usually is a little bit short. And the third generation sequencing is uh, very, very long, like a, like a Pacific Bioscience. I apologize, this needs to be updated. And, uh, and uh, it's very long race, uh, sometimes up to 60,000 bases, 
Well, for the nano core, there are some of the platform, some of the applications that goes to a few hundred thousand bases. This can be really, really uh, long. Okay, so those are the, the basic concept I, I want you to know about different uh, sequencing uh, platforms. Uh, and on top of, they're really fun. Uh, and uh, yes? I'm just curious, how much does the Nintendo Bio Sciences platform cost? I have no idea. I, no I don't idea. sell those, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, my understanding is the machine is still pretty expensive. And uh, um, it's a, a, like a more than, a, a million dollar range. It's very similar to our high seek four thousand, uh, uh, and this nano core is very cheap. It's a thousand dollar, right? So and uh, and they come with uh, uh, three assets. So so basically, it's a, it's a very very cheap. In normally, every single lab, and you can really afford to do this to do this. Okay. All right. So and then we we talk about uh, uh, what we can do with it. And uh, we talk about the basic applications, including sequencing DNA, and that will come with uh, three major applications, uh, de novo sequencing, which you don't have the reference genome, you need to really find out and the sequence the DNA, try to find it out. For the reference-based resequencing, basically, you already have a reference genome. My goal is trying to see how my genome is different from the reference genome. And then you are looking for SNPs, uh, sync copy number variations, insertion deletions and, uh, and things like that. And then metagenomics, so that, that will identify who is there in the mixture of microbiome species. And we talk about sequencing the RNA, which we will have three lectures in this series talking about uh, the data analysis part. But bottom line is you can sequence the, the, the transcriptome or messenger RNA and uh, or the microRNAs. And you can use it to study the protein DNA, protein RNA interactions, uh, like a chip seek, clip seek, or attack seek type of applications. So we'll get into more specifics when we get to that part of the, 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 the lectures. And then study epigenetics by using everything together. Okay, so what we are going to talk about today is a, a long laundry list. So we are talking about the, I will briefly talk about data analysis workflow and then the sequence quality definition uh, and then the alignment. I will be very, very quick and I will go through some specific things I need to, you to understand. But this is going to be really hard to swallow and I need you to go back home to revisit the lectures. By the way, our lectures is on YouTube. You have seen that, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully the, the quality of the audio is still acceptable. Uh, it was good for the beginning part, but it's uh, because I stay, stay there, stand there, and it's becoming a little bit bad. Anyway, alignment, and after that, I will talk about uh, the data format, and uh, uh, this is a very important concept, regardless uh, whether you are a biologist uh, that uh, needs to work with other people on the data, or you are in implementation that uh, you need uh, to really know every single detail about these uh, file formats. And I will try my best to squeeze in a little bit of slice or, or, or a little bit of time on the data visualization part because I see this is very, very important. And towards the very end, and then Sean is going to spend about half an hour talking about it, if I have a half an hour for you, <laughs> talking about the IU supercomputer system and it's a basic overview of that. Okay. So, and uh, there's an, another announcement before, before I get into the lecture is for next week that we are not going to have a class here, okay? So the class will be in the R3 building and the 428, room 428. And I would, I mean, talk about that towards the end. And uh, but that is uh, it's going to be a tour for the Center for Medical Genomics. Uh, I cannot get uh, uh, 27 people who register the class to go to the, the, the core at the same time. And that would destroy the machine and uh, or the environment at least. So, so what I'm going to do is uh, I, we will have a sign up sheet. So I will have five groups and uh, three to 3.30 and 3.30, four, 4.30, five. So five different groups, each group. And we will host about uh, five to six people. So just sign up your name. And for people who are auditing the class, we probably don't have the capacity for next lecture, but um, 
but it, you can send me email to make any re arrangement and I can give you a, a tour sometime uh, later, but just not at the, 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 the lecture uh, time, okay? So it'll be an easier class for you guys. All right, so let's go to the data processing workflow. Okay, so this is uh, one of the slides I want to scare you a little bit. So this is uh, my terminal. Uh, so one, I still know how to analyze this data and uh, I completely forgot already. Um, so that is in 2010, if you, you're familiar with this. And so you see that these are very, very early data sets. And uh, those are Illumina sequencing very early stage. And then for that particular file, if you look at this, this file is a 44.3 gigabits size in size. I thought, oh my, my God, this is a huge. But now we're generating probably 10 times, if not 100 times bigger files than this file, right? So if I use this Linux command to really get to how many rows that we have in this, this particular one has 38 million rows in this particular one file. And uh, of course, you cannot open that with your Microsoft Word. But when we open it, this is what the data look like. And this is not standard format. This was an earlier QSeq Illumina platform. So you can see those are a bunch of numbers here that is telling you which part of the slides it is. Don't worry about that. But the real important part is that this column. So you can see all those ACGTs throughout. And those are the sequences being generated. And then there is uh, some of the, the alien letters like uh, uh, and, uh, at the back of this. And actually, they are very, very important. Nobody can read it at this point. So I, we will try to make sense of these columns today as well. So, so those are actually representing the qualities of the sequence. So if you say this part is A, what is my confidence level But this, this part is A? So those are the representing the quality of the sequences. OK. Uh, in terms of the data analysis, uh, there are many different steps. But in general, people divide it into three different uh, categories. The primary analysis, secondary analysis, and tertiary analysis. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I didn't make those names. Okay. But uh, in general, the primary analysis is, uh, is uh, really just uh, to get, remember when we talk about the sequencers, and uh, the signal we really receive is either the electronic signals or the imaging signals how to convert those signals into the ACGTs. Those steps are called the primary analysis. Usually, the sequencing manufacturers will take care of that part. So when you generate the data, the primary analysis is already being taken care of. That's why I'm saying here, this is in the data production stage. Okay? The secondary analysis is, uh, in many cases, what we are going to talk about today. This is uh, the part that uh, you don't need to know the, which sample is cancer, which sample is coming from which patient. You don't need that, and you will be able to do the analysis, like a sequence quality evaluation and cleaning, like a, um, the sequence alignment, and sometimes you need to do a sequence assembly. So bottom line is you don't need to know different samples, what their relationships you are going to be able to do that. But the tertiary analysis will be different. That will be for very individual applications specific. For example, DNA, RNA, chip seq, epigenetics, they are all going to have their own way to do the analysis. And, uh, and we need to know very detail about the experimental design part. And uh, which sample are the cancer patients, which are the adjacent normals, which sample are pairing with which, and uh, so for those type of uh, uh, deals. So when we do the really, usually when people do the analysis, the first primary analysis will be done in the sequencing core. Secondary analysis, the bioinformatics core will be able to take on this game. And then, but for the tertiary analysis, and this is require a analysis team. So this team not only have the bioinformatics and the technology oriented person, but uh, we need uh, really to have a statisticians in the team. More important, the most important piece in this team is going to be the biologists who really understand what are the biological questions to be answered. 
So, so that is, uh, in general, the analysis workflow. So when people divide it into different subcategories. Okay, so this is a, a very quickly a one simple uh, example. Of course, we, we will get into much more complicated than this. You get the raw data, and you already see my raw data list. It's, it's not useful if you don't do analysis. It's just a, a few hundred million rows of sequences. And then you need to do the QC, quality control, making sure data is good, and after that, do the alignment. And the alignment, the, the meaning is that you've got one sequencing rate, you need to know which part of genome it comes from, and which, which we'll talk about intensively today about the sequence alignment part. And in some cases, one read can be mapped to multiple places. How do we deal with this type of situations? And after that, we need to do a certain level of annotation. For example, if we see the signal, we need to know where this signal is. Is this in the gene, in the promoter, in the enhancer regions? And what are they really trying to do? And after that, we will take the data to the statistical people or, or our implementation and trying to use the most appropriate statistical methodologies to do the analysis. But this is really just a, give you a general idea of what are the steps that we need to deal with even before we can start to look at it, do the data, real data analysis. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good on time. It's only 15 minutes now. That's great. <laughs> Too many things to cover today. Okay. So, so let's uh, start to get to the meat of the, the stuff. Okay. So the first part I want to briefly introduce is uh, the sequencing quality. And uh, if we talk about uh, the next generation sequencing, when we talk about the quality, if you ask me, what is the quality of my data? I actually don't understand what you are talking about. Because when we refer to the quality, there are several different layers. The first layer is, uh, we call it base quality. Okay, so what that is, is when we sequence, when we do the sequences, we'll got all those ACGTs. But for every single nucleotide that we got, not every single read, but every single nucleotide I got, I say this, Read for this, the first location is A. What is my confidence level? Okay, how confident I am. So this is called the base quality. So you will have this for every single nucleotide. And usually this is reported by sequencers. Are we trusting the data from the sequencers? We may not. And then, which we'll get into in the two lectures back uh, after this. So there is a, a sequence, the, the quality recalibration stage, uh, the, statistics, uh, the informatics part that we need to do. But, um, but the generally, base quality is uh, the, uh, uh, the quality for every single nucleotide that you sequence. The second level of quality is the mapping quality. Okay, so if you got uh, this particular sequence, you say this sequence is being mapped in this particular genomic location, what is my confidence level for that? How confident I am this is the right place for this sequence to be there? So that is a, a mapping quality. And you can see that this is not for every single nucleotide. Rather, this is for every single read. We are going to have one mapping quality. So because we do the mapping in the, using the read as a, a uh, a unit. And this will be reported by the sequence alignment algorithm that, uh, that we are going to use, which we'll get into in a much more detail today. The third level is uh, the consensus quality, which uh, after the mapping stage, for example, I see there are so many reads here. This position, let's start from this position. In the reference genome is A, but uh, most of my reads supporting this is a C, so I'm concluding this is a, a homozygous variance. And it's supposed to, in the reference genome is A, but in, the real, in this particular patient is a C. When I do this call, how confident I am on this. So that is the consensus quality. 
and uh, we will have one for every genomic locus, and this will be uh, reported by the variant colors. So we will talk about this intensively in three lectures, uh, two to three lectures from now. Okay, but for this slide, what I want you to understand is uh, when we talk about the next generation sequencing quality, you want to be more specific. You want to ask uh, how is my base quality, how is my mapping quality, how is my consensus quality, so that we know what level we are looking at. Okay, so this is uh, nothing fancy, it's just uh, for the concept of the clarification. All right. So next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, the quality scores. So when we give the quality score, in which form are we going to, to quantify this number? Okay, so one thing we are using is called this FRED score, P-H-R-E-D score. This is actually being published in 1998 in the human genome sequencing area. And, uh, and the, so basically, it developed a human genome project and it's being used for many years as the gold standard for the, for the quality assessment for the, for the sequences. Okay, so the calculation is very, very simple. It's very, very simple. It is a minus 10 times log using 10 as a base of the probability, this P, of the probability you are making mistake, okay? So let's say if I have a 10% of probability, I'm making mistake. And then if you do this, you see that your accuracy is going to be 90%. But if you put this in, and this is going to be, Q score is going to be 10. Okay? So if you say I have 1% of the chance to make mistake, and then the Q score after this equation will become 20. If you see 0.1% making mistake, and then you, your Q score is converted to Q30. So in the Illumina sequencing world, and when we look at the machine report, usually they will say, what's your Q30 percentage? Okay, so that is what that means. Meaning, what are the percentage of nucleotide being reported by the Illumina sequencer the error rate is less than 0.1%. Okay, so that is, uh, and actually this is not only for base quality, and as I mentioned er later, it will be the same for the consensus quality and mapping quality. It's just a conversion of this very simple conversion of the probability you are making a mistake. Again, nothing fancy, nothing difficult, just some basic concept that you need to know before we get started. Any questions so far? Can you just give an example for mapping We'll get into that intensively today. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right. Perfect. So now let's go to a uh, sequence alignment part. This is really a very, very difficult lecture to really give. And because myself is not a computer scientist, uh, and very few of you are computer scientists. So many things we are not going to get into details in terms of how to, do, to design this, how to design that, no. But I want to give you something from the conceptual perspective, how these algorithms are working, why they can do the alignment, why they are sequencing that, why they align that fast. So in terms of from the con con conceptual uh, perspective. Okay, so the first is what is a sequence alignment? It's a, a way to arranging the sequence of DNA, RNA, or even protein to identify regions of similarity. So if you, so it has, help, I mean, infer the, the functions, structures, evolution relationship between sequences, and those are why we're doing that. But uh, translate all those into English, that will be, we're just trying to find the best matching. Right, we got two strings, and let's see how they align with each other. And before we get into that, there are actually two things you need to, uh, the two different concepts. The first one is global alignment, and the second one is called local alignment, right? So there are definitions for the global alignment, there are definitions for local alignment, none of them really matters, right? If you look at this figure, you will see what that means. For the global alignment, we are trying to align 
we got two sequences strings, and we're trying to align them from the beginning to the end, counting every single nucleotide on both two strings into it to see how the best that they are aligning with each other. Okay, we will define what the best means. Okay, but uh, but this is a global alignment. But for local alignment, uh, it's uh, it's not for that. It, it, basically, you are trying to find a, a substring or a sequence element within these long strings, and then to see if they are matching and we'll be happy with it. For the next generation sequencing application, the most common practice is you got a sequence, let's say 150 bases. And then you map, you want to map that against the, the entire genome, like three billion letters, and you want to see where it comes from. So it cannot be global alignment. So it's a local alignment. But the difference is that you're, you want one string to be fully aligned in the substring of the, the longer one. Does that make sense? All right, so the concept of global and local alignment. Okay, your bioinformatics lectures will. Bioinformatics uh, uh, course lecture will be very mad uh, at me, and uh, why I teach things in this way. So basically, just throw out, throw the the, the concept at you, and and then without really giving a formal definitions. Um, but I don't have time. Let's, let's just go with this way. Okay. So so the goal is really analytically determine the best alignment between two sequences. So now we're coming to the concept, another concept level, what best really means, okay? So if you, you look at this one, this is actually for the proteins. And we got a 20 amino acid sequence. This is another 20 amino acid sequences, all right? So this is, we need to have uh, this type of matrix in order to define what the best means. So what this is, so you can see there's a lot of uh, positive scores along this uh, 45 degree line, which means uh, uh, adenine is the same as adenine, you got full score as your credit, but it, you got a mismatch here and this will be minus value, negative value that give you a specific penalty. So this scoring matrix is really just giving you a way to penalize if there is a mismatch, how are we going to make the, make the, the, the score suffer? Right, so this is, uh, again, this is more complicated for the uh, uh, protein sequences as a similarity score. For the genomics one, will be much easier. So we got ACGT, ACGT. Usually we'll say that uh, if they match, we give two point credit. If they mismatch, we give uh, minus one as a, as a penalty or something like that. So you have your way to define that, okay? So let's say, if we, we find a match, we get one, just a one, one potential scenario. And if we find a match, we give a one as a credit. And the mismatch, we don't have credit. But if there's, if there's a gap, we're going to give a penalty as well. So you, if you, you see this uh, as an example here, that, uh, and that the score is uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight positions are matching. So we gave a eight as our credit, and then there is a gap coming out, and I start to give some penalty to this alignment. And the penalty is going to be for gap opening, I will give three credit penalty, and every additional nucleotide extension of this will be 0 0.1 additional penalty. So you can see that this matching score is going to be 4.8, okay? Those numbers are not important. So what I want you to understand here is uh, there, in order to define the, what the best really means, we need to have a scheme of giving the penalties. And this is the way to do that. Is that clear? All right, so let's move on. In turn, yes. Uh, You mean for, for this particular one? Oh, it, it, it doesn't matter. So, so we're not getting into either global or local. So there is a lot of similarities in terms of how to find the global or local, but this is just telling you how to calculate penalty. Okay. And once we get to the, 
to the alignment theories. And again, I don't have time for this. We were not going to talk about specifically how to do that. But I'm just uh, leave it there is uh, for global alignment uh, like this, and there is an algorithm called the Needleman Wunsch algorithm. And then for the local alignment, this is called the Smith Waterman al algorithm. So, and I, I think uh, in any bioinformatics entry level course, you are going to force to be forced to learn these two algorithms, right? So this is so in in the past it was just defined as a bioinformatics. You have to know this. And uh, actually, I just uh, I, I in the past years I have a, a few slides to lead you through the global line or, or dynamic programming to find the best matches. And uh, we don't we where I'm not doing this this year, right? So if you're really interested in that. Uh, Go to the lecture. Go to the uh, some any bioinformatics course and trying to find. But the general idea is uh, you are going to first create this alignment matrix. This is the first uh, string. This is the second string, and then you do the you calculate in in a specific way what are different scores. And if you see a match, you add up the credit. If you see a mismatch, you give a penalty. And, and, and things like this. And then based on the score you get, you'll find the, the best, uh, uh, I mean, trace back uh, uh, path that, that will eventually give you the, the alignment scores, okay? So again, I'm not doing a good job. I'm not actually trying to do any job of explaining this. And you will have to go to other uh, course sources to look into the, the, this way to do this. Um, and this is called dynamic programming. And in theory, this will guarantee to give you the best alignment that you can find. Okay, the problem of this for us is uh, it's too slow. We cannot use it, all right? That's why that we will go into the, the other part of alignment theory um, to, to, to see that what are the, the real uh, way that people solve this type of problem. So, the fast alignment tools for short arrays, okay? So the short array sequencing for next generation sequencing, I'm more specific talking about the second generation, like a, from, from a few dozen bases to 150-ish bases, not for the long read sequencing. We will talk about long read sequencing in the later slides, but this part is for the short read sequencing. There are a few things that we need to consider. Uh, one, two things, one is the short, and the other one is massive amounts. So any alignment algorithm, if you really want to use it, and this, this two needs to be considered. And uh, when we consider this, uh, these two things, uh, there are a few things come to, into our mind that we need to be really be realistic. Well, first is the cost of the, doing the alignment. That cost include, first, the speed, right? Because time is money. Right, we, we are really getting five billion rates in one in three days, right? And then, if we cannot get in this data processed in the right in the in the time scale that we, we can afford, and that is the real cost that we cannot sacrifice. And the second one is how much computational resource is required. That will re, uh, talking into about uh, the number of uh, the CPU that we need to use and, uh, and then how much memory do we really have. So for different hours, they have different uh, memory footprints so that we need to be considered. So that's the cost part. And uh, the second part is uh, really the alignment quality part, meaning that uh, whether the sequencing gaps can be, need to be allowed. And now we are talking about why, why that's even a consideration. And uh, the reason for that, uh, even we are talking about four years, three years ago, there are some algorithms that being very widely used that does not allow insertion deletions, does not allow gaps. Now we are, I mean, all the algorithm has adapted that. So, so that is not a too much consideration, but in the past it was. And also another consideration for these sequence alignment algorithms is what are the information being considered? For example, are we only considered ACGT strings and to do the dynamic programming? 
or we also take uh, the base quality being calculated by the sequencers into the alignment. For example, if I see a mismatch here and I, I give a penalty, what about this mismatch nucleotide? The sequencing quality is very, very low. Like, like uh, the sequencers are not sure whether it's A or not. It's, uh, I'm just putting it there because it looks like A, so we can give a less penalty for that region, right? So, so those are whether those information are being considered or not is something that this alignment algorithm needs to consider. Of course, the most important part will be the accuracy part. Okay, so the major challenge for the short race alignment algorithm is that first, if you go to go through five billion times of dynamic programming is not practical. And it's, uh, there's no way. I, I wouldn't make further comments. So what, what to do for this is actually strategy, if you will, is actually to make a dictionary. Okay, how to do that? So, so I got a human genome already figured out. There are three billion letters, right? So if I say, I want to make a four-letter dictionary, and then we got A, 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 A. Here are the locations that start from A, 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 A. And then A, 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 C, here are the locations for that, and so on and so forth. If we have this dictionary, and we're going to be in a much better shape, because uh, next time when I have a sequence, and let's say my sequence is all four letters, and now I can just go directly to my dictionary to say, okay, here are the, my sequence, and then here's where the location is, or at least a, a bunch of options of that is, okay? So this is called a, either called a hash table or index, but this is basically you make a dictionary of your reference genome so that when we do the real search and uh, we can go directly to that location. The problem for this strategy is very straightforward, actually it's being used, is to make a, a certain length of the index, sometimes it's huge, right? If we make a four letter index, we're in good shape, that's no problem. But if we're making like a, a 50 nucleotide index, and that is requiring, I mean, how many rows, that's four power 50, and this is a 10 power 30, this many. And, uh, and you cannot possibly make that big an index to, to make it usable. So, so that is, a, there is a really a balance for this area. But generally, this is a one of the strategies people are using, which we'll go into a little more detail. So to do that is uh, to do, we, people do hash table based analysis. So what that really means. And uh, so you see we are having a, a query index, meaning that this is uh, the sequence you want to map to the reference genome, right, for this particular one. You want to know which part of genome it come from. And this uh, sequence, let's say, is 100 bases. You don't have an index for 100 bases because it's too much, right? So what people do is called a seed extension approach, and uh, it's very understandable that uh, you put a seed in the very beginning. Let's say I build an index. I cannot build a 50 base index, but I can build a 15 base index, right? It's a, I, don't, I didn't make the calculation, but it's a, a few gigabase of insights. I can still build that. And then when I take a new read comes in, I will look into the seed part, the first 15 base. And then I see, okay, based on my table, my dictionary, and the, here are where the mapping is supposed to happen. And then I further do the extension to see after going through this, whether which part of the, the later part is similar to my the, the original query sequences. So this is called the seed extension approach. And people actually are using that in a number of algorithms. And, uh, um, and sometimes this uh, uh, can be difficult in the sense that uh, there is a, when there are SNPs in the seed and how that will be handled, which I don't have time to go into that, then this will be designed, the way to solve that is to design multiple seed and they have a mask in that 
if you're interested in, I, we can talk about, chat about this offline. But generally, the strategy, the first strategy to do that is to build a hash table and offer, and then to do the seed extension approach. Any questions so far? Yes. That, that, that is a possibility scenario. So, so to go one base and the other, so you, you are talking about the, the extension part, right? And uh, for the extension part there, you can actually use dynamic programming at that point because there are so little options that you can go through. And then because sometimes the dynamic, dynamic programming also allow the gaps. If you, you simply, based on what you describe, it doesn't allow gaps that can be bad. And so, so you, you can do the, do the, the net pro programming at that point. Uh, so, but there's, a, there's a, a number of ways to solve that problem. That is not a concern anymore because we only focus on these uh, three locations and we much less computational uh, resources needed. So for all these, it's really about the speed. It's really, that's, that's mo most of the consideration. Is. Any other question? Okay. The second strategy to do this is called the prefix and suffix tree approach. And uh, the most important way to do this is going to be called the borrow Wheeler's transformation, okay? And, uh, and they, or BWT, okay? And uh, for some people who had done some of these uh, alignment algorithms, I'm sure you know Bowtie, you know BWA, at least you've heard about it. And they are both using the borrow Wheeler's transformation. Okay, so the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about this transformation. All right, not to say that we want to replicate any of this uh, uh, algorithm or, or something like that, but I have an obligation to teach you this because uh, for the students, especially from School of Informatics, if you graduate, at, at one point, hopefully you will graduate, and hopefully you'll find a job. And during the job interview, and uh, it's a possibility that they will ask you to of this. So I, I want to spend a, a few minutes really talking about this uh, borrow winner transformation. Okay, uh, I, I have another slides on the hash table. So this is a, it's basically the seed extension approach I already went through. Right? There are some algorithms using the uh, the the. Uh, see the extension approach, so I'm not going to go too much detail. So now, let's turn, turn our attention to the borrow reader. I need you to be really, really uh, focused on this, and uh, and meaning that you you pay attention. You, you if you are half asleep, and this not going to happen, you won't understand this. Okay, so let's let's go through this. So what is uh, borrow reader transformation? And uh, it's actually developed by Michael Borrow and David Wheeler uh, and from DEC uh, and the Research Center. And uh, in 1994, this, uh, this transformation, it is not used for sequence alignment at all, right? So it was designed to do, do the data compression. Actually, uh, one, you, you currently, you have some, I mean, I'm sure you do zip a lot. And then one of the zip is bzip2, and actually they were using this borrow reader transformation. It's a data compressing technology, okay? And uh, so, so this is uh, the initial uh, string. And then here is uh, what the after the, the borrow reader transformation is. So, so just a, a, a few key things. The first one is uh, uh, when you, after you do the borrow reader transformation, all the letters will remain for the same values. And the second one is that their orders are going to change, okay? We'll get into that, why that, that is, we, we still want to use it, right? So, so, so I mean, this, uh, this is uh, for the compression part, okay? But now let's see that how this weird transformation can help us to do the sequence alignment. Uh, so, just follow me on this, okay? And uh, I, I promise you, I will have 
uh, some of the exam questions on this as well. Uh, so, um, so let's uh, see that first, how to do the borrow waiters transformation, what that really means. Actually, it's very simple. So what you do is this is your original string. You can consider this is as your reference genome. Okay, our reference genome is a little short, only six, uh, six letters, A, C, A, A, C, G. So what you do is uh, you add a dollar sign at the end, okay? And then you do this. So you basically, you put your original string there and then move this to the back and then move another one to the back and then move another one to the back, okay? And then you are generating now seven different, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six different uh, streams. Actually seven, seven different streams. Is that, does that make sense? So far so good? All right, good. And then the next stage is uh, you are going to sort these strings based on their first letter. If they tied at the first letter, you sort based on the second letter, and so on and so forth. For example, dollar is considered the smallest one, and then A, C, G, and T, okay? So you see that uh, this is the original string, and then what you do is uh, you have the dollar lead to this, uh, and then A, and then for this one, because they tied, and this is A, and then look at the second letter. For this one, the second letter tied as well, and then look at the third letter. Basically, you sort based on these sequences. Does that make sense so far? Okay, and now we're going to the last column. And uh, this last column is going to be your converted borrow wheelers uh, string. Okay? Are we okay? I, I know you don't know why we're doing this, but, uh, but uh, do you know what, I, what this will be done yet? Okay, so there will be uh, YouTube, hopefully, and if we are recording successfully, and, but you, you will be able to figure out uh, in, in the, uh, after the class if we don't, okay? But so, so basically, and then in the middle part, you get rid of it. So you have the original string, and then you have uh, the borrowers transform the strings, and this is uh, this is uh, your final product. Okay, so basically, this is the, the index we are going to use, and you see the nice part of this is if you consider this as a dictionary, this dictionary is going to be very small. This dictionary is going to be the same size of your original string. It's not related to how big your dictionary, how many letters you want to cover, or anything like that, okay? So, there are two questions here. Uh, the first one is, uh, what, so this is a string that is a reversible, meaning that uh, I now have a original string, which is uh, your reference genome, and then I did a BWT, Borovator's transformation, and it become a transformed string. And this transformation is reversible, meaning that if we trace back properly from the transformed string, we can go back to what the original string is. Okay, you see, of course you, you can do that, but think about that, it's not always the case, right? So when you do the programming, like in R or in MATLAB, you have a command called sort, right? Do you have a command called unsort? you never have a command called unsort, right? So once you sort it, all the information are lost and you cannot come back to the original stream. But this one has the ability to come back to the original stream. So, so that, that is what it is. And the second question is uh, how this strange transformation can help us, possibly help us to, to do the sequence alignment, right? So we'll go through this. So the first question is uh, why this uh, transformation is reversible. So in the sense that uh, if we have a transformed string, how can we get the original string? That is uh, what the question is, all right? So what you do here is uh, quite simple actually. 
and you can read this, try to make sense of it, and uh, usually they write it in a way that every letter is English, but you, it, you put them together, it's really hard to understand. That's how computer scientists write their, their papers and the instructions. But if you, you really look at this, this is your transform, this GC dollar AAAC. So what you do is uh, you just make a column, JC dollar AAAC. And uh, this last column is going to be your transformed form, okay? And then you also have your first column, right? How, how you get your first column? It's a, you just uh, do the sorting of this last one and you get the first one, right? So the dollar and the A, you got three A, AAA and CC and G. And the middle part is still invisible. That's okay, we don't need those, okay? So now you have the last column, you have your first column. So now you're doing the real backtracking. So in the sense that uh, uh, make a, it's called LF formatting. This is what I, I talk about. Okay, this is uh, what I talk about in the way that uh, every single word means something, but you put together, it doesn't really mean anything, right? So, but what really this uh, LF uh, mapping means is uh, it's, a, it's a ranking game. So for example, if you got this A in this uh, uh, column, and this is the second A, right? And then actually this corresponding to the second A in the first column. That is always the case. Okay, you guys are late, that's fine, but you just come to the most difficult part. So, I <laughs> always oh, with us a little bit, so don't be scared away, okay? So, so this is second A corresponding to the second A in the first one, okay? So this is what this LF mapping really means. Okay, the way to do this, to do the reversible part is, uh, is like this. You got your last, your, your transformed form, GC dollar AAC, and this is the sorted one, okay? Now we're trying to find out the original string, what that is, right? So you just start from the last, the first one. This, this is G and this is G, so don't worry about that. And then next one you see, this is the first G, right? This is the first G, we have only one G, of, one G, of course it's the first G, right? So, and then what you do is you go to the first G in this column, and then look at what is the last letter? It's C. And then you put C here, okay? And then if you look at this C, it's the second C, right? This is second C in this column. And now you're looking for the first one, you're going to the second C. And then what is corresponding to the second C? It's an A. And then you put an A here. This is your third A here. One, two, so you have two more A's in front of it. Okay, now you're going to the third A and then corresponding to A. And this is your first A, okay? And then we go to first A is here. Next one corresponding to C, you put C here. This is your first C in this column. And then you, you go to look at the first C here. This is the first C corresponding to A, and this is your A, okay? And then based on this iteration, you will be able to generate the, of, original string that, that is, a, is a being transformed. Does that make sense? Uh, I know, I mean, you guys are following me, yes, every single word really means, but still, a, a, a question hung back there is uh, why this can help us with alignment, right? We'll get into there. But at this point, do we know that uh, how to do from the, the, the reverse, the, from the converted form back into the original? string. Are we okay with it? At, at least uh, you, you can look at the slides and then trying to figure out, right? So I'm explaining to you, right? When, when I was trying to figure this out, there was nobody explained to me, right? I was looking at the 
uh, that's my guess. That's my best guess. What I told you. <laughs> okay. So now let's get into to see that uh, the real question. Okay, how we can use this to do the sequence alignment? In terms of uh, this is is uh, the string. This string is our reference genome. But if I have a substring in the middle, and how do we do the sequence alignment? That is the real question we have. Okay. So now you you will have this uh, type of definition. So whatever it is, you can go back to read it and then try to make sense of it. But let me lead you through what this really is. Okay. So now here is uh, again, you don't have anything in the middle. The middle part is invisible. That's why they're gray, right? But you do have this uh, transformed form, which is your reference genome. So if you think of my reference genome after BWT conversion, it becomes this, okay? And then you have your first column, which is sorted. Does that make sense? Okay? And now you have a, a sequence. This is your query sequence. You want to do the sequence alignment. You want to know that whether my AAC is in my reference genome. That's the question. And if there is, where it is coming from. Okay. So what you do here is initially you see this AAC. Well, I, let's say if it, it is in my reference genome. And I can be anywhere from the first letter to the last letter, right? So this is my searching space. Okay. So now next one, the first time that we do the sequence alignment is we only focus on the last letter of your query. So it's A, A, C, right? Now we come to C, right? And then we go here, we see, oh, there is a C, but there's a more than one C. And then there is a range from here to here. There are C, okay? And then you look at this, and then the next one is A. After C here, your query sequence is A. You want to know that which is A. So you see, oh, both of them are A. And then comes the next one, and the, the both of them are A, right? And then this is the second A, this is the third A, now you're coming here to the second A and the third A. And then let's look at the, look at the next letter, which is A. And then you see this one, the next letter is a dollar sign. No, it's not right. But this one is an A. And then you see this is the first A. And then you come here, you see, okay, this is a, the first A that it, this is the first A that is referring to here. So now you'll find your original query sequences, AAC, in your original string. Does that make sense? So let me do this again, okay? Do this again. You, this is really, really smart and very difficult to understand, but let's do it again, all right. So you have the, this string, which is a, the BWT transformed uh, reference genome, okay? And this is, you have the first column, which is uh, the sorting of this. It's a dollar and a 3A and then 2C and then G, right? So this one, these two, once you have this, uh, this index, the reference genome, and you have this column and this column already. So now you have a query string, which is AAC, you want to see whether AAC is in my original sequence. That's the question. So in the query string, you start from the last letter, which is C. Okay. Now you see in here, how many C's we have? We got two C's. And then this is my range, the first and the second C, right? And then I see what is my next letter in the query, which is A. Right? And then you see, okay, the first one corresponding to A, the second one also corresponding to A. So they are fine, they're okay. They're both of them are okay. And then we see, okay, this is the second A, this is the third A. I'm going to here to look for my second A and the third A. Okay? 
And then the next letter is going to be A. And I see this one, it's not right. But this one, the last letter is also A, and it's the first A here. So at this stage, I answered one question after all this walking part. I answered one question is uh, AAC is in my original sequence string. Does that make sense? So if you look at this, actually, those are your cheat sheet, right? Those are, are where it is, actually. Okay? If you don't understand, that's okay. Go back to your notes, you'll figure it out, okay? But this doesn't answer your next question, which we'll get into, is uh,